Every package that contains food needs a label. If the label is to be of any use, it must tell you three things. First, what food is in the container. Second, what that food is made of, its ingredients. Third, the person or firm who packed or labeled that food. These are the essentials of properly labeled pre-packed food. It doesn't matter where the words are placed, provided the description catches the eye of the buyer. And none of it is framed in any way so as to mislead or confuse. The problem of the consumer confronted by a bottle or package containing a food or drink, the label of which tells very little about its contents, is not a new one. It's not that there may be risks in not knowing enough, since all food must be fit for human consumption. No, it is rather a question of giving to every shopper the information she needs about the food she is buying and, after all, consuming. Sometimes the shopper is able to talk directly to the shopkeeper and discuss what she buys. She sees that she is getting the food she asks for. And she has a place of which she knows the address if she wants further information or has cause to complain. Under shopping conditions which are more common nowadays, however, the shopper may feel projected into a confusing wonderland, roving through row upon row of shelves containing bottles, jars, cans and packets, offering a bewildering choice, and from which she must choose exactly what she wants. Should she want to know more about anything in this maze of pre-packed, dazzlingly labelled food, she may have difficulty in finding out what she wants to know from the hard-pressed staff in the store. <laughs> Under these circumstances, it is clear that extraordinary powers are required for the shopper to know more about the ingredients in the containers. Oh, real strawberries. Or to shorten the distance between her and the remote producer of the package. Uh -huh. Fortunately for shoppers, someone is fighting on their side. Madam, I bring you the labelling of Food Regulations 1970, which came into operation the 1st of January 1973. One, subject to the provisions of Regulation 6, no person shall sell by retail any pre-packed food other than intoxicating liquor, unless there appears on a label marked on or securely attached to the container a true statement as respects that food in compliance with this regulation. Two, the said statement shall specify, A, in the case of a food consisting of one ingredient, an appropriate designation of the ingredient. Like that. The of they all do. But that's the government's way of making sure that the three things mentioned at the beginning are written as accurately as possible on the food packages you buy. The simplest of the regulations is the one about name and address. The law says that the label must show the full name and address of the packer or labeller of the food. This applies to nearly all packaged food and the letters must be big enough to be read easily. That's true of all the compulsory labelling, by the way. The rules to do with the description of the food inside are more complicated, but only so as to make the description tell you as much as possible. Where the food is just one thing, 
there is very little problem. Although sometimes there may be a need to say that the food has been processed in some way. With a lot of prepared food, the name has very little to do with any one substance. But what goes on the label must be a name that everyone understands to mean the food in question. Where the food is a dish put together from various ingredients, the wording must not be vague, but must describe all the food properly. The wording is affected too by the proportions of the ingredients. The one named first is the one of which there is the most. If the proportions alter, so must the order of words. With some foods, the name may seem to describe something else. This is allowed if it is the name that everyone knows that food by. You can use that sort of name too, if it has been in use for at least 30 years. So the chances are that no one will be misled. Part 2, paragraph 11. The labelling and advertisement of foods as respects flavours. There are cases... Oh. Well. where the description makes you think that the food gets its flavour from a particular ingredient. A fruit, for instance. A similar sort of food, attempting to have the same taste but using artificial flavouring, must declare it on the label by using the word flavour. This shows it is different from stuff made of the real thing. What's more, only the food made from the genuine article can carry pictures of the fruit on the label. These are just some of the examples of the way the regulations control the names used to describe the foods in every shop, so that they tell you what you need to know and won't mislead you. While the description is made as informative as possible, it's still only a description. So that you know what the ingredients are, the rules say there must be... An appropriate designation of each ingredient thereof in the form of a list. Like this. They are normally listed in order of quantity by weight. certain foods where the ingredients are nearly all the same in quantity. They can be listed in alphabetical order. There are foods which, when they are sold ordinarily, are labelled and have their ingredients listed as usual. Where these same foods occur as an ingredient of another food, can be listed simply by the description. These are foods that don't show a list of ingredients. Along with some others, they have their ingredients controlled anyway by other regulations. It's on the labelling of foods which make claims about health, slimming, energy giving, things like that, that the regulations are strictest. Any label which claims that a food has an actual slimming effect is totally forbidden. Claims that are permitted have to relate to facts that can be proved about the calorie content. If there is a claim on the label of any food, or in advertising to do with it, that it gives more energy, or it has a high calorie content, it must also say exactly how many calories there are in a given amount of the food. Claims on vitamins and minerals, too, are carefully controlled and must relate only to certain vitamins and minerals. The quantity of each must be given in relation to prescribed amounts of the food itself. In conclusion, I, I would like to mention that should you have cause for complaint about the labelling of any food and you can't get satisfaction from your supplier,
the enforcement of the regulations is the responsibility of local government. If you're at a loss to know which department to approach, the Citizens Advice Bureau can tell you who the inspectors are, who carry out the work as part of their consumer protection service. Now you've seen what the rules are about. From now on, there'll be no reason for not knowing what the food is we're buying. But it won't make any difference. The family will still be as hard to please. <laughs>